Well, uh, we can start up at the beginning that uh, my work has always been about trying to capture something that and the viewer wasn't aware of. In 2011, I had an exhibition in Savannah. And three months ahead of time, I started dreaming of my grandmother. She'd been dead 40-some years. And so I got four remaining sisters and a brother. And after the second dream, I said, any of y'all dreaming about Big Mommy? And he said, oh, no, we haven't thought about Big Mommy, you know. And then after the third set, I had one sister said, I don't know what you were doing, but you better get it together because Big Mommy didn't play. So you better go back and sleep and figure out what she is trying to get you to do. <laughs> Big Mommy had talked to me a lot about cockman stuff. And so, I mean, you know, I, I'm struggling with it. And then finally I said, and maybe that's the cock. So I called guy, three farmers. The very first one said, yeah, you can come photograph, you know, the cotton. And he said, but you want to photograph cotton? I said, well, I just got back from uh, South Dakota photographing corn. And so I went to start photographing cotton. And that was the first experience for me. I had never seen cotton. Raw cut. I'd never seen it or anything. And so I'll never forget driving this 35 miles outside of Savannah and I'm saying, I ain't seen no black people. I said, Big Mommy, you're not sending me someplace I can't get out, are you? No. And so, uh, so I sort of had discussions with Big Mommy at times, you know. And so, anyway, this particular farmer's daughter had just graduated from art school with a major in photography. I said, now this is too, this is crazy. This is more stuff going on, you know, here. And so then we spent the morning and he took me around and stuff. First introduced me to all his family. He said, well, this property has been in my family for seven generations. And then flipped me out. Because like, Big Mommy and sent me home. In the beginning, I photographed, I was like, I was documenting photograph. I mean, uh, this is cotton. And then the more I experienced it, it was like, I started getting these feelings like, what would I have done if I had to do this? What would I have done if I had, if I was getting beat because I didn't do? And so because of that, I started creating a number of what I call surrealistic images that were to emotionally involve the viewer. Uh, my grandma used to tell me stories like, well, you're really worried. It's it. You don't really have to worry because the angels are going to be there, always going to be coming. So I got one piece of man saying the angels are coming. You know, so, so that's how it started. Then in 17, one evening in 17, we were out photographing, and I, by this time I found a farmer who really liked me, and I felt safe. Because at times, uh, agents took us to where we were going to photograph. And other times they wouldn't leave. They would stay with us all day. You know, so I thought this wasn't so safe for me to be hanging out here doing this, you know what I mean? And so, uh, in 17, I told Francis that slaves didn't run away in the daytime. They just couldn't say bye, you know. So, uh, in 19, we went back to Hobgood, North Carolina, and I photographed cotton at night. My whole experience in the cotton field is like being a place I've never been before. It's really emotional. I really feel. And it talking about, you see, talking about the ancestors, for me personally, it's feeling my grandmother and my family. But also, I'm aware I have a daughter reading about the, the, the ancestors that, you know, we came to this country with a, you know, with a history. We were connected religiously. We came with a lot of education and a lot of things. We were, when we came, connected to our ancestors a lot. 
I would hope to strike up a curiosity, but more importantly, to investigate how they respond to this. The idea is to get them to be aware of where they are. Wherever they went, wherever they are, it's fine. But you can't go any place if you don't know where you are. I gotta say, here it is, it's out there. You know, I hope I'm not upsetting you and uh, I hope you get something from this and go. And the next time you see your grandmother, you hug her. Mm -hmm. I don't care who your grandmother is. You hug your grandmother or you hang your, hug your mother and father and you think about them. And you might even investigate their history in the past because that's who you have stood on. Whether you like it or not, you stood on them. Oh, you're getting me started. <laughs> you're getting me going into my to my Baptist preaching. I don't want to go there. <laughs> I'm supposed to be cool. Yeah. critical race theory. Somewhere, there's a man sweating and weeping in the South. The man's labor is an incomplete thought hanging in the mind of the master of the manor. As a matter of Southern manner, the master of the manor has a half memory of the laborer's humanity, leaves the thought hanging there like weeping cotton, like a supplicant under the lash with no option but to feel the wrath of a pirate obsessed with the theft of the weeping man's dignity. The South remembers the expression of the trees, like a child looking away from the doctor's needle who wants to stand there still staring at the blood on your leaves. The South remembers the cotton weeps. The North, Starlet, Harriet, and Scarlet, Watch Nights, and Oracles. The master of the manor takes a perverse pleasure in luxury through torture. The laborer will tell you of the fabric that costumed it all, of a dead body as both dance and drum, of a neck new snapped, rhythmic impact gone, swaying with the wind gone, like a dilla kick against a tree trunk. The cotton muffles the sound of its own weeping, cries inaudibly like eye contact between cheaters and keepers of secrets, quiet as a knife while master sleeping in the sheets of enslaved sewing. He reaps Jesus with impeccable spell, with soulful genius, with abundance and fidelity to the soil and what it yields as if fruit can come from God's earth and not feel what its roots have redeemed in some version of American truth. Cotton weeps power from the pores of a powder blue sky. Cotton is 
a hurricane swept through and then gone, swept in like a black life and then gone with the wind, gone like the truth of a dark American night. Cotton is a strange fruit, indeed. Breathtakingly animate as it is authored in the memory of Southern order, the methodology of American innovation and efficiency, the truths we tell or hide, and why, and why a broken man would broker a hanging memory of an ancestral lie, and why be critical, why theorize about race, why not sit still in the window, staring into the void, listening to the muffled sound of cotton as she weeps.
in the arms of mountains. A gentle wind, like a loving granddaughter combing her grandmother's hair, carried her gift to the beginning. We think it's ice, but really it's cotton on the top of mountains built on the bones of those who came before. A gentle wind blowing white hair off grandmothers, up and up and up, settling in the arms of grandfathers who were lynched or whipped or shot but always looking at grandmothers to reflect in their eyes the love. A gentle wind carrying the white hair to the waiting arms. We call it glacial, we call it ice, we should call it cotton, resting in the arms of our great mountains. <laughs> <laughs> 